Hi everybody, TJ Mack of Vintage Cards and Nostalgia here. Hope everybody's doing well. Now I had on my list of 2023 collecting goals to pick up 12 Diamond Stars cards. And we're in August of 2023 here and I haven't picked up any yet. Now while I still plan on focusing on building the set, I'm just not feeling it right now for some reason. It may be because there's been quite a bit of Diamond Stars content lately on YouTube and that has satisfied my need to see the cards. But I'm not really sure exactly what it is. The good thing is, even though I'm a pretty focused collector, I have a, enough interest in the three sports I collect to go into another area that may be more exciting for me at the moment. Now, I've talked about in the past how my 2023 collecting goals are used more as a compass rather than a GPS. Where I'm always moving in the direction I want my collection to go, even if I'm not at the exact spot I planned on being in. Now for me, that is the balance between being focused, but still being flexible enough to be open to a good deal, or adding an unexpected item, as long as it fits within the puzzle of my collection. Now in today's video, I'm going to show you three pickups I've recently made that fall right into that line of thinking. Now, even though I haven't been picking up any Diamond Stars, I have not abandoned my focus on cards from the 1930s. Now, one of the things I enjoy doing is reading about players who could be considered Hall of Famers, but are not really remembered today. Like most, I know quite a bit about Hall of Famers in the three sports that I collect. And for me, the longer I'm in the hobby, though, I have this desire to expand my knowledge to players that I don't know as much about that are either on the cusp of Hall of Fame, of the Hall of Fame, or were superstars during their time. So my research into some of these players led me to want to pick up this beautiful 1934 rookie card of Indian Bob Johnson. Now he does have two Z-Nut cards in 1930 and 1932, but he was with the Pacific Coast League and not Major League Baseball, so this would be considered his rookie card. Now first off, I love the different shades of blue on this card. And I wanted an example that really captures the vibrant colors. And I think I got one here. Now from a condition standpoint, it fits right in with my other 1934 Gaudi cards. And I'll show them from further back in a moment. And I, you've seen these on my channel before if you watch all my videos. But first I want to share a little bit about Indian Bob Johnson. Now, he was nicknamed Indian because he was born on a reservation and he was part Cherokee. And I know it's not the most creative name, but that's what they tended to do back then. If a player was Indian, they would call him Indian so-and-so. Now, for the stats, guys, I want to share his counting numbers real quick. Now, in just 13 seasons from 1933 to 1945, he made eight all-star teams in those 13 seasons. He finished his career with a two hundred ninety six batting average, 2,051 hits, 288 home runs, 1,239 runs scored, and 1,283 RBIs. Now those are excellent numbers. In an 162 game season, he averaged 178 hits, 25 home runs, 108 runs, and 112 RBIs. He was noted as a very consistent player, and in his entire career, he never really had a bad season. And what makes him really interesting is that he did not make the major leagues until he was 27 years old. He was a married father of three and a firefighter who was playing semi-pro ball with his brother Roy. And then Roy pursued a career in baseball and made the Tigers in 1929. Bob thought he was better than his brother Roy. And when he saw the money he was making, he wanted to pursue a major league career as well. So he traveled and bounced around some in the minors to include the Pacific Coast League before finally making the Philadelphia A's to stay in 1933 at the age of 27. Now, I would argue that Bob Johnson is as good as some of his contemporaries that are in the Hall of Fame, like Chuck Klein and Jim Bottomley, but he played for some bad A's teams and he just didn't get the recognition. And I think he also shows pretty well in the various Hall of Fame standards on baseball reference. Regardless, he is a player that I just love having in my collection. Now, because his story is so interesting, he just is somebody that I like to look at. I shared a story with my, my oldest son, and he, he got an interest in him. And that's just really what I love about collecting is those connections. 
And he's just a great baseball talent who was stuck in the, in the minors for a little while and just didn't make the late majors till later on due to life reasons and, again, just taking some time to get his way up there. And this is just a great card that goes well with my other Gaudi cards. Now, I was able to get this card, and I'll share the price for a hair over $100 shipped to my house, which is a nice bargain for a rookie card of a near Hall of Famer. Here's the back of the card. This card <laughs> it just looks great with the other three Gaudi cards in my collection. Not working on the set, but I like to pick up cards here and there that just draw me to them. Uh, the next card I want to show is this 1969 Topps card of Cowboys linebacker and 2023 Hall of Fame inductee Chuck Howley. Now, a couple weeks ago, I did a video showing my 1961 Topps and Fleer football cards. I was mentioning to one of my frequent commenters, Gannon, about how the 1969 Topps set combined two of the best elements from the 1961 Topps and Fleer sets. And I'm going to show that here now. Now, here you can see on this Don Meredith rookie, which I forgot to show in that video. It's probably the best card in the 1961 Fleer set, and it's uh, my favorite card from the set just a beautiful card of him at Yankee Stadium and this was taken in uh, late in the 1960 se season in December when the Cowboys played the Giants and the Cowboys ended up tying the Giants that year they didn't win a game all season but they did manage to tie, tie against the Giants so just love this card and I just love the stadium uh, backdrop there so what you're getting here though in the 61 Fleer card is you have the logo for the Cowboys on this card that you see also on the 69 Tops card, and you get the color backdrop on the 61 Tops that they used on the 69 Tops card. And I just think it's two of the best elements of these cards combined into this 1969 Tops card. And I do love the 69 Tops set, uh, especially the first series that has got the borderless cards, the, the full bleed, as you can see here on this uh, Chuck Howley, just a wonderful looking example here. Now, Howley only has um, five mainstream issued cards and then a few what they call the oddball cards, I guess. And his cards that were issued mainstream were 66 and 67 Philadelphia and then 69 to 71 Tops. So you can see here I also have a 71 Tops card. Love this set as well with the uh, colored borders. And in this set, the red were for the AFC and the blue were NFC players. But if you were an all-star player that year or an all-pro, you'd be red and blue. So that's what Chuck Holly was that year. And again, just a, another beautiful set like the 69 Tops. Now, when I was a kid, I knew who Holly was. Uh, he was noted as being the only player from a losing team to win a Super Bowl when the Cowboys lost to the Colts in Super Bowl V, played in 1971. But I want to share a couple things I learned about Chuck Howley. I don't want to go on and on about him, but these things were kind of interesting for me anyways, is I didn't know he started his career with the Chicago Bears. Now I'll do a shout out to my friend uh, Brian at Bears Card 34. And he played with the Bears in 1958 for 15 games between the 58 and 59 seasons before retiring in 1960 with a knee injury. So he decided to try, though, and play again rather than run a gas station and he signed with the Cowboys, and from 1961 to 1972, he only missed four games while making five All-Pro teams as an outside linebacker. And he was very intelligent, very fast. Um, Bob Lilly said that he just knew what was going to happen before it actually happened. He was one of those kind of players that just had that great anticipation. And I picked up both these cards um, for about $16 each, and they're just uh, great additions to my collection. You can see the back here of the 71. There's the back of the 69. The last card I want to show today is this beautiful 1960 Parkhurst Jean Beliveau. And I did not have any plans to add this card this year. I'm actually looking for a late 50s, early 60s card of his teammate, Hall of Fame goalie Jacques Plante. But I came across this Beliveau card, and it was such a stunning card that I know I had to have it. And one of the things I try to do is I try to buy a little bit more expensive card once a month. I don't always do it, but if I find a card that's, you know, a $100 or more card that I really like, I'll try to pick it up if it fits within my budget. And this card just stood out to me. 
Now I have cards of Beliveau from 68, 69, and 70, and then I also have this 55 Parkhurst that you can see here where he's wearing the white sweater. So I figured I'll get one of uh, Beliveau in his uh, red Canadian sweater as well to go with it. And this is just, uh, again, a beautiful, beautiful card. And Beliveau was one of the three best non-goalies of his era, along with uh, Gordie Howe and Rocket Richard. He might be one of the best uh, 10 or 12 uh, non-goalies of all time. And he's known for his imposing size. He was six foot four, skilled puck handler, and had incredible grace on and off the ice. He has a very similar mystique, and I talked about this before in a video on him, just like Joe DiMaggio, but he didn't have the ego and the pettiness that DiMaggio had. And after the Rocket uh, retired in 1960, Beliveau became the captain of the Montreal Canadiens, and he won five Stanley Cups in that role to go along with the five that he had already won before that. So he won 10 Stanley Cups. Only Henri Richard has more with 11. And Beliveau also won two MVPs. He was just a fantastic player, and I cannot believe that I won this card for just $125 shipped. I mean, to me, this is like Willie Mays or Hank Aaron from that year. And a Willie Mays and Hank Aaron in a grade six of this quality is a $400 plus card all day long. And to get a Beliveau delivered to my door for $125 to me is a great value. And that's where I'm going with my collection is, again, I, I'm looking for the best values to get the best cards. I don't typically, uh, I don't upgrade my cards and I, and I only sell occasionally when something doesn't fit anymore into my collection. And when I buy a card, like I said, like this, I, I want the best quality that I can afford for my money. And that's just how I collect. I want to have very similar quality with, with my cards. And I've talked about it before. There'll be some big cards I never will have for that reason. It's just the way I collect. I'm very big on display. And I like to take my time when I acquire cards. And, and that's really how I build my collection. So very pleased to add this card. And the other thing I like about this card is right here. Is this card goes nicely with his Hall of Fame line mates and uh, left winger Dirty Birdie Olmstead and right winger Boom Boom Jeffrey on. And this is just a wonderful display here of this great line of the Dynasty Canadian teams. So that's all I have today. Everybody have a great weekend.